Thank you, everyone. Um, hello, thank you for uh, joining us today. My name is Dave Thomas. I'm Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Bales and Associates. And I want to thank you and welcome for joining and welcome you to today's Encore presentation on our, one of our informative fr informational Friday sessions with HCM Spreadsheet Designer Overview. Can't talk today, sorry. Um, today's presenters are Candace, Kelly, and Nikki. And before we get started, and in case you're not familiar with Bales, I'd like to take a second and tell you a little bit about us. We've been in the Infor ecosystem for over 26 years, and we are entirely Infor focused. We do nothing but Infor implementations, upgrades, and managed services. We support all aspects of the technology and applications, including the S3 Landmark and Cloud Suite products, HCM, finance, and supply chain. In fact, we've been recognized in partnering awards in eight out of the last 10 years, and our consultants bring 15 plus years of consulting experience in the Infor Lawson space with the equivalent in professional experience. Some were former benefits managers, compensation managers, directors of the supply chain, as well as former controllers and CFOs. Um, we're really proud of this year. We were recognized by class for 2020 to be top in class. And what that means is class is a, a research firm that does uh, research on healthcare software implementation companies. And we were recognized because of our methodology and this client satisfaction interviews that they did to be in the top tier of class with a 90 plus rating. And we're really proud of that. That uh, means our, our clients are happy and our processes that we use to implement Lawson are in the top tier of the M4 ecosystem. Um, we're also excited this year. We've got some news from earlier uh, earlier in the year, February, effective February 1st, uh, Bales became part of Nordic Consulting. Nordic is an industry leading healthcare consulting firm. Will operate as a wholly owned subsidiary and continue to be led by Jamie Bales as president. Nordic will provide us with the resources to fund our growth, expand our business, and support our customers more effectively. For healthcare customers, it allows us to bring together Nordic's capabilities in the EHR space to provide a more holistic solution, including specific expertise in EHR and ERP integration. This combination will offer a best practices model to reduce implementation risks, leverage the data from both systems, and drive insights and outcomes. Again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it over to the presenters. Thanks, Dave. Here's a list of public Facebook groups openly offering this mobile people as well. Yes, I think someone. Let's yeah, perfect. Thank you. Hi, all. I am Candace. I am one of the Bales consultants here on the HCH DM team. Early morning for me, guys. Sorry. We're going to talk this morning about spreadsheet designer. Um, so our agenda is first we'll do a spreadsheet designer overview. Then we're going to go into how to create a single business class query. We'll work through creating multiple business class queries. How to utilize a query from a list. So if you're using delivered lists or you're using lists in in, um, in Mingle now, how to utilize those? How to upload data, and then we'll go through any questions. Please, if you have questions as we go, feel free to put them in the chat. Nikki's helping me monitor the chat and we'll try to answer them as we go if we're able. If we run into any questions that we're not able to answer during the session, we'll take them and we'll work through them and then get back to you. So let's talk about Spreadsheet Designer. So what is Spreadsheet Designer? Spreadsheet Designer is a Microsoft Excel add-in that's utilized specifically for the landmark application. It allows you to both query out data from the landmark application and upload data via Excel. So we'll start with some landmark basics. Um, many of you have probably used the rich client. We're all now starting to use the web UI. We have spreadsheet designer and process flows. These all of these products are tied to each landmark release. Many of us know we have a landmark, we have a release coming out this weekend that does uh, affect spreadsheet designer that we'll talk about a little bit later on. If you utilize, um, if you're using Mingle and you go through the other links and you're utilizing the download um, from your reveal page, what is nice about that is every time there's a new CU applied to, to spreadsheet designer, it will automatically update your spreadsheet designer. So some of you remember, may remember back in the old days, we'd get an update pushed out 
we'd probably have a little bit of uh, issues with our spreadsheet designer and we'd have to go upload the newest version. We encourage everyone to start using the spreadsheet designer link within your other links in your mingle pages. That now will allow you to get your automatic updates every month you get a new CE pushed out. Um, if you're somewhat new to Infor and Landmark, you'll know that there's now, instead of using the term table, which a lot of us would use for a database structure, spreadsheet designer and Landmark are the term business classes. Business classes are similar to database tables. They indicate things like your field names, your types, your sizes. They also contain infrastructure, your rules on how those interrelate, your conditions, your context. Those of you that use uh, GHR, you know, it includes your actions, your exit rules, all of those important things and how the application works. Um, some of you may ask, uh, is there a standard uh, database dictionary? We've all asked that question, but at this time, there is not a standard database dictionary, um, but we encourage you to use some of the functionality in the data menu that will give you some more details on what fields are available in which business class and which relations exist. Key fields, similar to database, there are key fields in business classes. When you're using spreadsheet designer, you'll notice those are generally in an orange or yellowish, yellowish color, and those help you identify what those key fields are that you'll need to either export or uh, query for uploads or that you'll need to use to upload back into the landmark data. So some key features of spreadsheet designer um, what you can do in Spreadsheet Designer, Spreadsheet Designer is a very powerful tool. If you've used it, you know, or if you're used to add-ins from an S3 perspective, very similar in this. You can define multiple queries in one Microsoft Excel. So if I have one workbook open, I want multiple tabs. Within each one of those tabs, I can have my own query. I additionally can have my own upload on each one of those tabs. So if I want to learn how to query some information down and use that query to upload right back up some changes, um, what's nice is I could have those all in a workbook and make that shareable work amongst my team. I can upload an entire workbook or I can upload a selected range. So as I've begun my work and I've identified and made the changes that I want to upload within Spreadsheet Designer, I have the option to either load essentially the entire spreadsheet at one time, or I can be more selective, have more control, and I can upload via a range, or I can type in the range. So you have a lot of control in your upload process through that, that way. You're able to define your queries and parameters and then save them, just like we would in Excel. One of the beauties of Spreadsheet Designer is it's very user-friendly for those of us who have experience in Excel. As I create my query, I can then uh, save them. I can share them just by sending someone an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and Or I can keep those in maybe a shared drive and I want to share them amongst my coworkers to be used over and over again. It also allows you to leverage the landmark technology, how it's built. It utilizes security. So you, you won't have anyone that's able to query out or upload things into the application that they don't have the security to do within the application itself. So if you have constraints around specific fields or you have uh, maybe an HR generalist who doesn't have access to full employee data, then that same security will be applied when they go to try to query that data. Um, so if they unintentionally add fields, it will just come back as blank. It'll still let them finish the query. It just will not provide any data back in those fields that they don't have access to. Additionally, you can continue to use the full functionality of Excel. So those Excel wizards out there that really enjoy making pivot tables or other uh, more advanced options in Excel, you can query out the data within Excel using that as kind of your uh, using that as your master data, and you can still now use the full suite or the full set of tools within the suite of Microsoft Excel to manipulate or adjust that data or view that data the way that works best for your organization. Add-ins in Spreadsheet Designer. If you are a client or someone who's still using both S3 and you're either moving into a landmark product or you're going to start using it, you will now see two tabs. 
So you have your add ins tab, which some of you may be used to, and you will have an, one called inform, which is where you will find your ISD. These are not mutually exclusive or, and they're not required to be together. So what you can do is if you do not need add ins, you won't need to load that tab or enable that tab is a better terminology um, to use ISD, which is the in for tab. So let's walk through understanding how to use spreadsheet design. First, we have our little in for icon here. And this is an area that allows you to access, access the online help. A relatively new feature is by accessing the online help, it will now take you out to a version of the user guide. And I recently reviewed the available help through this, and it's very useful. Um, at times, it was maybe more lean. It's definitely been bulked up in the most recent probably year. So if you do get stuck or have questions around ISD, this online help is a great place to start. You're also able to view a log of transactions. Uh, used for debugging, probably used more from a technical perspective, or if you have a ticket open with Infor, this may be an area you need to use, and you will be able to see your product version. Um, this is helpful if you are starting to see maybe some slowness or some things happening in ISD that you weren't used to. You can go make sure you have the most recent version of ISD. If you do not, all you need to go is back out to your Mingle page, re, um, click on, and download the most re recent version and it will get you back up to date. Then we have, we start to move into our functional items. We have our insert queries. This is what you're going to use when you're ready to pull data out of the system. You're gonna create a query. So you have your query settings. Um, within this uh, insert query, sorry, I need to drink water. Within this insert query, you will have the ability to do it from either a business class or a list. Sorry, I apologize. I needed to drink water. You'll be able to do this from either a business class or a list, and we'll walk through that more. But this is where you'll set your uh, insert query options. Next, you'll have your insert upload. You can see this red box that created. This is what you will utilize when you're ready to take the data that's in your spreadsheet and upload it back into the landmark application. So let's talk about a query. So what a query allows you to do is extract data directly from the Infor landmark applications. I've been talking about it more from an HR perspective. This also works within the FSM application that works for the supply chain application. And as we go through our presentation, we'll use a supply chain example a little bit later on. It allows you to select fields from one or more business classes. We'll talk about how you can relate fields. And uh, from an employee and HCM perspective, we would think about it as linking both our employee and our work assignment business classes. You can utilize filter criteria. So as I start to create my, maybe I get all my fields and now I want to limit what records I'm looking at, you can utilize some filter criteria. The filter criteria itself is um, continuing to grow. The filter options have gotten more robust in the last year or so. You can use the Excel application to format your data. What I like to do is after I query my data out, I like to keep my query as is, and I will copy and paste my data as a text field, uh, text only, and then I will manipulate it and put it in what format works best for my presentation that I need it for. And you can create simple operational reports. We always find it very useful in the HR space to create a set of queries that can be used for auditing on a regular basis. Um, and can be used within either maybe the benefits group or an HRIS group um, without needing to recreate the wheel each time. So let's walk through creating a single business class query. We're going to use the example of an employee address, a very common thing that we might pull, finding all employee addresses and find uh, all employee addresses on a specific date. So if we go within the application itself, and some of you might recognize these pages, they're some rich client pages. Um, the same thing works, it looks slightly different, but works just the same in a Mingle or web UI version, is if you need to find out, uh, let me back up. Sometimes the most difficult part of spreadsheet designer is knowing what business classes to query. 
We don't always know those intuitively. And most of us have been around, we know that some of them are very specific uh, as you get into employee data. So the easiest way to go around and find what business class you want to query is to do what we call a control shift click. And you are doing a control shift and you're clicking on either the form. And in this case, we clicked on the form. Or if you need information about a specific field, you could do the same thing on a specific field. This is the same as the idea as a control shift O in S3, if you're used to an S3 environment. What will happen is then you'll get this pop-up. And the first item that's going to be visible that says name, this is your business class. So if we want to find information about employee address, we're going to query the employee address business class. If we click on a specific field, um, I, if I had clicked on maybe control shift click on the address field, I would get also the information on this field name. So it would say employee address, and then I would also say that this is a street, I think is address line one, address line one. So that's how you can find specific details as you start to query. You're going to first log in to your query now that you know what fields or what business classes you need. This is a, a fake example of how to log into your server. If what's most normal is you'll have if you're using a Mingle environment, it is your same Mingle name uh, and environment name, and there's a slightly different URL. So I would talk to either your technical resources or if you have consultants, we can help you. Um, also make sure you have the appropriate server. Then now that we know and we're logged in, we're gonna insert our query. I showed you here, we have the options to either do a business class, a list, or a user folder. We're not gonna talk about user folders today, but what user folders are, are if you have made a special list via configuration or personalization, you can access those lists here. This is not um, a common item that is utilized by maybe your more functional uh, employees. So most HRS groups or most benefit groups likely wouldn't use that option. They would be querying via a business class or a list. I'm first going to pick my environment. So if you're in prod, if you're a, a live client, you're going to pick a production. HCM production is probably your PRD. And then you're going to select your business class. So we had talked earlier that the business class in this example is employee address. So this is a very user friendly field. I'm welcome to use the drop down and it will give me a huge list. But it also allows you to type. So in this case, I can just type, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take one more drink of water. I apologize, allergies are still getting to me. So in this case, I can start drinking, uh, I can start typing employee address. So I would just start typing the word employee and the system will filter that down for me to all the words that start with employee. This works really nicely with the large volume of business classes. So I generally would encourage people to use that option. Once I've selected my business class, the system will give me access to all of my fields. My I apologize, I keep having a slight coughing fit. It'll now give me access to all of my fields. So what I can do here is I can now select um, everything I want available in my query. And anything in yellow are those key fields that I talked about earlier. I wanna make sure I'm querying those because if I need them for an upload, I will need those back later. Anything in black, are the fields that help me gather more data on my uh, query. So you'll want a combination of both. In this case, I will likely want to know the address, the city, the county, things like that. Um, so let's keep going. 
if I collect, if I click this select all, it's going to select every field in the business class. That works really nicely for a um, small business class. For a large business class, it can be slightly overwhelming. So I wouldn't necessarily necessarily encourage that. This unique ID here at the top, from a query perspective, I encourage people to always uncheck that box. Um, and you can see here, similarly, uncheck that box. It is generally a large system assigned number behind the scenes that you will not need. And you definitely, you generally don't wanna be uh, querying or confusing people by using it. So I, I would generally uncheck that box. Here you can see I've now inserted my query, which all I did was do by clicking this button here, insert my query, and I now have my properties. You can see here it says query properties, and I now can turn those on and off here. What's nice about using this button to, if I click properties, is instead of deleting my query, which you can see is an option up here, say I created a query and it wasn't useful for me or not needed, I can just go ahead and click it and delete it and be like it didn't exist. But maybe I just want to not see the parameters. By clicking this property button, it will give me more real estate where my query is now more visible and it will hide my parameters that I've utilized. So that's the option there, which is helpful when you're trying to see more data. Here's where I can start to add my filters. So I've queried my data. I have my selected fields. You can see my headers here. Now, if I want to add a filter, I right click on any uh, field, doesn't matter which one, and I can say add filter. If I click on the employee field and add filter, it's going to add the employee down below. This is, can be used if I want to search for one employee at a time. Maybe I want to know addresses for one specific employee. Um, I can do the same on many. In HR, it's not uncommon that maybe we want to see everyone in a specific county or a specific postal code for, for a, a defined set of reasons or specific city. I can do the same thing with any of those items. Within your single value filter, you can do a few things. So if I just want one value, say I'm using employee as my example, I can type the value and I can use an equal sign in front of the value. Um, what's nice about the filter option is you can type directly in or you can use, let me back up. Oh, you can't see it in the screenshot. There is now a little funnel uh, next to the value that will allow you to use, if you've used custom groups, it uses a, uses a very, very similar type of product to allow you to create your own, um, your own constraint using a wizard type of a tool. If not, you can just type directly in. You can do an equal sign in front of the value, or you can just type the value. For example, <clears throat> you can filter entering just uh, CSM. In this case, if I had an employee as my value, I could type just the employee number. If I'm using multiple values, I can do things in uh, another way. I could start with maybe a partial string. We used address as an example. Maybe I want to use postal code, and in many postal codes, um, depend, they all start with certain specific values in specific areas. So I'm in the Northwest, I might start mine with a 9-8, and that would give me everyone in the state of Washington, or a 9-7, that would give me everyone in the state of Oregon. So I can use a partial starting to get me a longer list. Oops, I apologize. I can enter the value of 7 to get all the records that start with 7. Same works with alpha, not just numeric. If I want everything that starts with the value S, I can just type in S. Um, if you have a large employee population, Keep this in mind when you're doing some of these partial filterings or things that just start with. The query may take a long time to get through large volumes of records, but this works very nicely to get your, your query moving. You can also use the um, standard comparative operators. I can use the greater than or less than. I can use greater than or equal to. Same concepts that you're used to in other tools. You can use that for both numeric and alpha. You can also use a pipe to create and statements using a single filter. So if I'm looking for three, one and three, 
I can use a pipe to help delineate and uh, filter my records on the on both one and three. <clears throat> Works. This does work as an and statement and not an or statement. So different than some other languages, um, but a pipe is going to be an and statement. If you're looking for an or statement, a one or a three, many times I'll just set up the query. I'll copy it and change my value to a three, and I would run two queries and merge them. A lot of times that's much easier than some of the more complex <clears throat> ways you can filter. Date format is something to keep in mind. When you query, um, you're going to use a different date format than if you upload. Uh, the upload is similar to the format you see directly in Landmark or in um, GHR, a month, date, year. When you query, you're going to get uh, the year month date. So keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is on date fields, sometimes it's really a timestamp and you might need to be more specific in what you're looking for if the time is attached to action. We see this mostly in our employee export or in the export those, um, those behind the scenes business class. Unless otherwise specified, some date fields uh, may indicate another format. So we're giving you what most fields are when you query or upload, <clears throat> but there are times where you'll find, like I talked about the timestamp, other in uh, other formats that you'll want to be aware of. So refreshing an executed query. So we've now created our query. We've added a filter. When we want to update it, we have two options. Technically, we have three, right? We can click on this little page guy up here with the green arrows. This will refresh. I generally stay away from this guy. Um, in my experience, it refreshes all of my pages. And generally, I'm not wanting to refresh an entire workbook at one time. If I click the arrow under the word refresh, and I click on just the word refresh, this will update uh, and refresh my one page, my one tab that I'm working on. Uh, so if I've done work or other things on other tabs, they won't be uh, they won't be changed. If I click the refresh all, it will refresh all the tabs that I have queries set for. I caution about this because I've accidentally refreshed my own workbook on more than one occasion. And if I've made other changes or I've gotten uh, other queries ready for upload by refreshing them, I'm likely going to wipe away the work that I've already done. So. Be aware of that from a refresh perspective. Um, the refresh, the first one works very nicely for just refreshing one page, but both work nice just depending on what you need for your current work. So after we refresh our query, these are the results that we get. So based on the fields that we selected, we're getting our, uh, our relevant information back. We do want to point out that when you run your query, you have two options here. You have show value and show state. And just so you can see the difference, I'm going to go back one. You can see this first one that we ran says show state. And you can see here, instead of maybe the number for HR organization was 101 or it's one, you're going to see it's going to show you essentially what we would call the description, right? If I run a similar query, here's another good example, where I say show value, I'm now going to see generally the code or the numeric value attached to a specific field. So in this case, this is a, I believe it's a CSM example, an SCM example, where I say show value, it's going to show me the numeric value attached to that field, where when I show state, it's going to show me the word validated that's associated with that value. Both have a good place to be used. I generally like to show values if I'm going to be doing something to use as an upload later. I'm going to use show state when I'm doing something that maybe I want to show more front end or end user to see information that makes more sense to them. So keep those in mind. What's nice about the show value and show state option is if you run your query one way, it says show state, you can easily just change it and run it again. So I sometimes forget, run it the wrong way, and I change it and run it one more time. So it's very flexible. Um, so let's talk about specific dates. Within Spreadsheet Designer, there's also the ability to use what we call the as of date, something we use 
pretty regularly in HR and I'm sure in, in FSM and supply chain. You can now set your as of date. So say I want to see in this case, they wanted to see um, suppliers as of a specific date. If you set your as of date here in this option and you refresh your form, it will now show you all of those that were in the system as of uh, June 1st, 2013. Keep in mind this uses the true effective date, not the enter date or created date is a more appropriate term. So if I have uh, added a new supplier or I'll use an HR example, I've added an employee effective January 1st, but I entered it on January 5th, my, this will now pull into my query based on the effective date. This works very nicely and when you're trying to pull data. I use it a lot in the HR space to look at salaries. If we're trying to do some type of salary comparison or understand uh, changes in salary over time, this is a really nice feature here, um, similar to what you can get within the application directly. <clears throat> Now, once you've created your file and you've created your query, this is where you can now, as we talked earlier, you can save your query. By clicking on file or the save button, it works just like Excel from this point forward, where you can uh, save it like a regular query. So, or I'm sorry, a regular spreadsheet. So let's use that same idea and create a query based on multiple business classes. Business classes within themselves that have, have relationships. Business classes with a one to, um, you can relate business classes in Spreadsheet Designer if they have a one to one, not a one to many. So in this case, I can create a relationship on something like employee that has a one to one relationship. To do this, we do something just like we did earlier to add a filter. You right click and you get an option that says add relation. Same functionality that we'll walk through. We're going to hey, Candace. Yes, ma'am. There's there's actually a question out there. Um, uh, talking about the as of date. Is there a limitation on how far back you can go with the as of date? No. Well, let me say that. This technically no. You can go back as far as you want. It all comes into obviously how old your data is. So that would be your only limitation is your data, but the system will allow you to go as far back as you want based on your data. That's a really great, great. question. Thank, okay, you. thank you. So let's use a supply contact as our primary as our next example. So we want to find the primary contact information, first name, last name, and address for each supplier in a supply group. So what we're going to do first, we're going to make the assumption that we already found the business class, that we've already added the appropriate fields, and we're now wanting to add a relation on our employee, I'm sorry, our supplier group. So I've picked my appropriate fields. What I do now is I right click on the supplier group, and as you can see below, we have the add filter, which we talked about. Now you can do add relation. These will always show up on each field if they're available. So if there's not a relation available on a field, it will be grayed out. So in this case, we would click add relation and you'll get a new pop-up that shows up um, that'll allow you to select which relation that you want. In this case, we're gonna select the primary contact for HR people on the phone. And I apologize because I am an HCM consultant, so it's hard for me not to relate it back to HR. For HR people, a lot of times we do this on an employee. We would that would be our uh, fields that we connect. So we're gonna do this on primary contact. And now what happens? Let me back up to this screen. So you can see this is our first business class, which we chose supplier. Now that we've added a related business class by by adding the fields here, you will see we now have another heading called primary contact. This will show up at the bottom. You can see here we're, sc we're scrolled pretty far down the list. This will show up at the end of the fields on that first business class. So after all the fields on the supplier business class, I scroll down, I'll see a bolded business class called primary contact. Below that will be all your new fields. So if you're looking for them, they don't kind of mix all in. They just start to add to the bottom. From there, I can now add the fields associated to my primary contact. 
in this case, we've done given name, family name, um, and some other items. Then you can see here by putting check boxes next to those additional fields, they now pull into my query. In this case, they came in in columns I, J, and K. And I, J, and K, um, the columns before that continue to be the information I pulled in from the primary business class, the supplier business class I had utilized earlier. We also, just to show you down here, this is also filtered by supply group, which we've set up as S. M. So that's why you're seeing a relatively small list. From a primary, uh, I'm sorry, from a multiple business class perspective, it works, all the same functionality works around refreshing, um, deleting, and properties. You don't get a change in functionality. What it does is it allows you to pull in fields from multiple business classes. Like I said, in the HR space, we do it a lot with employee and work assignment. Maybe some employee and addresses, you might see that same type of information um, in supply chain. I'm, I don't have any good examples except for this one, but um, it, it works very nicely to allow you to pull multiple fields. <clears throat> and from there, just like you could with a single business class, I could copy and paste this. I could use all the rest of the Excel features that are available, available. The last option around querying that we want to talk about is querying from a list. So we have a couple items here on how to query from a list. It works very similar where you're going to select from a business class and then you're going to select from a defined list. The lists available to you in this function are the pre-delivered list. If those of you have used custom group and as you create your custom group at the end, you run it, it says choose from a list. This is the same list of values that you would see there. So these are the pre-delivered values. All fields are available um, for the list and can be selected for the query. It displays, um, displays all output, including related data, if the fields are included. Just like a, a query on a business class, you can use filters and you can use ads update. What won't be available to you um, on these, if I remember correctly, is the related because you're not relating it to a specific business class. So that functionality is not available. So let's use another example, example around suppliers that need validation. So you'll find a supplier in the supplier group that needs validation. So first, we'll start with our query. Different than we did the first time, instead of clicking on business class, we'll now click on list. Once I do that, I'll pick my environment, like we've done in the past we will pick our business class, which is supplier. Based on that business class, there are a predefined set of lists. These are um, seen here. Like I said, these are lists that you see in different ways within the application. So I can then select my list. In this case, I can select my suppliers who need validation. This is a standard list. And I can see there's only three fields. This is in the case that a lot of times I'll just select all, so I don't have to select each field. I can now run my query. It's a refresh, just like it is for a business class. Um, and I can add a filter. So by right clicking on any of the fields here, I can um, add a filter like I've done below. I can refresh and it will now show me all of my people, I should say all my suppliers that need validated within the supplier group of SCM. So, we can do this in HR the same way. There's work assignment uh, lists that are available. There's active work assignment lists that are available. Um, things like that, your resource list is available and we could filter on a specific group. So same functionality, different uh, areas of the application. Before I move to upload, are there any questions about queries or querying that we can answer? Okay, then I will keep going to uploading data. So um, we've talked about the queries and how you pull data down. So let's talk about how you upload data. Uploading data works um, similar in how you format your data. It works different in how you upload. So you are required to just do one business class at a time. So if you have some employee data to upload, you're going to do all of your employee data first, the fields that are associated in that business class, 
If you have a work assignment or an uh, employee address business class, you will create all of those separately for upload. You create the data in the Excel application. What's nice is you can cut and paste. You can even import from another file. Maybe you have a vendor file or something like that that you need to bring into uh, Landmark. You can copy and paste that and put it into um, the appropriate format. Uh, within that, even if you don't have something to copy and paste, sometimes you just type type it in directly onto Excel. Um, if there's a small amount of changes or maybe you need to change a specific field on the spreadsheet, you can do a manual entry. You can use the query to provide headers and the proper date format. This is something I encourage you to do most times you're going to do a query, especially if you don't have a template set up. Generally, what I like to do is go add one manually of whatever I'm trying to upload. I then will query that out and that helps me get the appropriate headers for mapping, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it also helps me validate every format that I need for those uploads. Um, and it's helpful in making sure I know my key fields so I get those in the right format. So here's an example. Let's add a new state for our supplier location. So I'm in the application and within the application here, we can see um, we have a variety of states set up. Just like we could uh, before we could do a control shift click if we needed confirmation on the business class or the field information and we could validate to ensure that we're creating the right value in the right field. So we're able to see here our list directly in the application. We now are doing a we are now doing a query of that same information so we can make sure we know what we're working with. Um, in this case, we'll query to make sure we don't accidentally create duplicates. We now, when we query, we get our headers. This is very helpful from a mapping perspective and I'll show you why in just a minute. Um, we've now queried the appropriate information. It shows us all the um, required fields. I wanna point out over here in the yellow orangish yellow i'm not sure what color it is for you guys these fields show me what my key fields are for this business class and these are the required fields i need to do an upload back into this business class so in this case for this supply chain group they need country and the code essentially they need to create the code um, if we used an example of employee some ones that kind of are a little confusing is on the employee business class, you're required to have start date, relationship to organization, and relationship status, regardless of what field I'm uploading. So in general, I would encourage you to do a query first to make sure you have those uh, key fields. So we now have our information we've queried. First thing we're going to do is remove fields that we don't need for upload or we don't want to um, necessarily have for upload. So we talked earlier about this unique ID. I generally, I always remove that on an upload. I can do that in two ways. I can uncheck the box and that will remove it. I can also right click, click and delete. Um, they do two different things. If I uncheck the box, it will remove it. And next time I run my query, it won't include that data. If I right click and delete, it will remove it from this file this time. But when I refresh, it will add it back. Both of those may be used um, for your business needs, and you may have a reason that you want to look at a particular field, but when it comes to uploading, you don't want to upload it. So keep those in mind um, on how you use that. You can see we've added a filter to this query. Um, oh, sorry, I got one ahead of myself. You can see they right clicked and deleted. So in this case, they wanted to delete all of the information that I had queried and just use one example so that I can. Um, upload back into the system. So all you do is highlight the rows, uh, do a right click and delete. This is so you don't unintentionally upload information you already have. We've left one example. I encourage you to do the similar thing here is you lose, leave yourself one example. So then you can go create your new data based on your example. I now can insert my upload. So we've talked a lot about this query section. And over here, I get my insert upload. So on my insert upload, I click insert and I'm gonna, gonna, going to get a new wizard. 
this wizard will pop up that looks very similar to the query wizard we used earlier. I will first validate my um, area, my where I'm working, my business class. And then you have a new field here called action. By using the drop down, the system will show you all the actions that are available to you. Likely you'll get a create, an update, a delete, which I don't encourage you to use very often, um, things like that. Some of the more complex forms, business classes may have more options, but in general, you'll see those options available to you. You then can um, map your columns. In this case, if you've gone through the step of querying and having the headers available to you, the system will nicely map it for you. So you don't have to do that. So just by opening it, the system has identified the fields and it's mapped it for me. If I think it's out of sync or maybe I've gone and deleted something after the mapping, I can click this reset mapping and it will reset it for me. Here you can see I'm using column headers. Generally, this is important. I encourage you to use headers when you're using a, a ISD upload or a spreadsheet designer upload. If you don't, that, that's fine. Systematically, you can do it, but it gets confusing down the road when you're trying to identify what you fit, uh, uploaded into what field. So I encourage, encourage you to use the header. And then once you have your field set, you can click insert. One area that I wanna point out is do not get you don't need to get stuck on if everything's mapped perfectly in this step because you will have a second opportunity to map and validate your mapping after you get past this step so what i like to do is open this let the system map it for me if it can and click insert and then i do any additional mapping or changes via my properties here on the left hand side which we'll walk through now so you have a couple items. Let's start with the top. You can see my data area and my business class, which we had chosen the, in the wizard. You can see the action that I have identified. From here, you can change this action. And this happens to me on occasion where maybe I do a create or I do an update and I meant to do a different action. So you have the flexibility to adjust that. Only thing I will caution is as you change this action, your mapping will reset which may be completely fine, but if you've mapped this, you change your action and you need to remap it, just be aware um, that that can happen. You can now select a couple options depending on create. So because I've clicked create, I also get a checkbox that says update if already exists. Those of you that are used to S3, you know in add-ins, we had a very similar option. What's nice about this is if I select the create option, it will create it, but if maybe uh, Wyoming, I'd realized the spelling was incorrect and I wanted to adjust the spelling, I could do a create and an update at the same time. So I could have Wyoming, if I have update, if already exists, when it hits the code of WY and it sees that there's actually a change, it will upload that value that I changed, okay? If I leave this unchecked, which is also, um, there's good business reasons to do, if it hits a code that's already been created, it will just skip over it and give you a message. Usually it says code already exists or um, state already exists, something like that. And you, it will then just go through the ones that need to be newly created. So um, both have a good purpose to utilize. Next is confirm all warnings. From an HR perspective, this is helpful if you're making any data changes to pay rate. And if those may put someone over or under a, a schedule, a salary schedule or a salary structure, I should say. So this is helpful. What this does is if you're in the application and you're making a change and we get those pop-ups that say, are you sure? Or they're asking you to confirm the change. By clicking this checkbox, it is essentially saying yes to those warnings. So this is a helpful checkbox. If you are, if you upload and you get a whole bunch of items that say uh, confirm with question mark, and you're like, what happened? Generally, that means this confirm all warnings needs to be checked. You can just go in and check it and rerun your query. So that's what that does. So let's talk about mapping. So as I've created my information, I've queried out what I needed 
but I've now come to realize I needed an additional field. I needed an effective date, which as many of us know who've, who've uploaded, you generally always need an effective date. So what you can do is make it very simple on yourself. What's nice is these fields do not have to be in a specific order. So in this case, if I need to add an effective date, which generally will be the first date on your field list, and most times it will start with the business class name, underscore effective date in lowercase. So if you're looking for it, that's generally how you find it in the system. I can add an effective date by adding a column header here. You can do two things. If you make it match exactly and you type the column header, then you can click reset mapping. And by redoing a reset mapping, it will add your column D here, right? So that's one way to do it. I also use that if for whatever reason I've determined I missed a field, I added it, I can reset my mapping. That works really nicely. I wanna add one other thing though that also um, works well. Instead of reset mapping, if I wanted to add effective date, sometimes I might just type the word effective date. I don't wanna type the whole thing. That's perfectly okay too. I can update my field and I can manually map any of these fields that I want. Just by clicking in the white space. Um, in this case, there would have been white space where it says column D. I can click on that, add column D and it will map it that way also. Just the only word of caution is after you've manually mapped anything, don't click reset mapping or it will clear it out and then you'll have to do it again. So now that we've mapped all of our items, we're ready to start our upload. So we have a variety of options in upload. It works very similar to the refresh. If I just click this um, one that looks like an Excel spreadsheet, it will uh, start to upload all of my tabs. Generally not what I'm trying to do, but Maybe, you know, if you have a large workbook and you just want it to run, you can click that. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I found in my personal experience that the system likes to load about 1200 records at a time. So if I have the ability to load smaller batches, it seems to run more efficiently. In large business classes, it does and natively batch uploads and that works very nicely too, but I like to control it. So it's completely a business decision for you guys. That works that way. If I click under where it says upload and I have the arrow, I'm gonna get this item here. Uh, sorry, do I have one more screen? I'm gonna get another item that says upload all or just upload, upload selected values. And I can click on that and I will get this one that says upload selected. I get this upload select row selected upload rows sorry that's hard for me and i get a couple different options here i can use current selection which will mean that i have highlighted rows and by highlighting rows that's making that my current selection if i use that and click ok it will only upload those that i've selected i really like that option especially when i'm testing an upload before i want to upload the whole spreadsheet so maybe i've created my spreadsheet I want to make sure I don't have a bunch of errors. I'll generally highlight the first couple rows, use current selection OK, and that's a nice way for me to test a small sampling of my um, upload before I do the whole spreadsheet. I can do a very Hi, similar. Candace. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt. There's five yeah. minutes left. I just want to let you know that Perfect. there's another one coming up soon. So OK, no problem. We're almost done. Awesome. Okay, Thank you. Great. Dave. I can do a very, very similar item using the enter specific range. And in this case, all I do is say I want to start at maybe uh, row two and end at row 13. And it will do the same item as though I had selected those. So you have different uh, different options within this. Or you can do an upload, upload all, which will do multiple sheets at multiple times. Works great, just a little out of my comfort zone. So you can pick what works best for you. Once you've finished uploading the system, it will then give you a confirmation message. If it's green, it means it created and it will give you a created message. If it's red, it's going to show you an error message. Most of the messages at this point in Spreadsheet Designer are fairly uh, straightforward and easy to understand. So take a look. My, in my case, most of them error because of dates uh, that maybe I've put in the wrong format or I've accidentally used a state instead of a value. Those are kind of my two big errors that I make. You may have slightly different ones. 
So now you can see I've created my new state, Wyoming. And that's how you use upload. <clears throat> One thing we do like to caution is the ability to, I don't think I have to say this to this group, but just in case, the ability to, to upload is a very uh, robust um, tool within the landmark product. And we do always encourage clients to make make sure who they've given the opportunity or the tools to be able to upload is selective. Um, it is very powerful and can help do a lot of great work. It can also, if someone uses it that doesn't know how to use it or isn't very skilled, it can also create you a lot of work <laughs> to clean up. So just think about that as you start to learn and use the tool is maybe start small and get bigger because um, it is very helpful to get things in, but it could also cause you a little bit of havoc if you're not using it correctly. So next, we'll just end with a summary. So we've talked about a spreadsheet, I'm sorry, we've talked about spreadsheet designer, <clears throat> which is similar to an add-ins product for the landmark. It does authenticate against security, which is a very nice feature. You're able to do queries of both single or multiple business classes. You can also do queries off of a list. <clears throat> Someone in the last session asked, does that allow you, that list allow you to do a configured list? That list function does not allow you to do it off configured list, just the delivered list. Um, you can filter results by value and by date. Um, in the newest version of Spreadsheet Designer, there's a lot of filter options if you use the funnel. I would go click on it, and if you're used to custom groups, it works very, very similar. So go take a look. You can also upload data to business classes, or you can save data and query. So before I get to questions, there is a new update coming out this weekend on Spreadsheet Designer, and it has an excellent new feature coming out this month that um, in our current state, generally, if you have a query going, it, or I should say query or an upload, um, running it in the background wasn't always the easiest. There is a new update coming out this weekend that will now allow you to run queries and uploads in the background. So you can be doing other things in both Excel and in, on your desktop. So check, watch out for that. It's a great new update. Um, and I'll see if there's any questions. And if not, I'll get us closed up. Nope, nothing in the chat. But if anybody has a question, no. Okay, so we just want to remind everyone our informative Fridays are going to be coming back in July. So our next quarter series starts in July. If you're not already following us, check us out on our social media. We're uh, trying to post regularly to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and work out loud. You can see we try to keep you updated on things going out um, in the in the in for space. We also have some additional Encore sessions coming up this month. So these are things that um, if you'd missed, we've done in the past. So we have reports, lists, and cues in supply chain, a beginner guide to IPA on the 25th. I apologize, I got these weeks backwards. Config console, IPAs, and process improvements, and beginner guide to IPA part three, all coming on the 18th. So check those out. And lastly, we have our uh, coffee with consultants. So if you have a particular question or want to review something with the client, please feel free to reach out, uh, check out balesllc.com, and you can set up um, a session through, it's probably Molly or Dave, and uh, work directly with one of our clients for about 30 minutes. So thank you all for joining us, and I hope you go check out our next session we have going on. Great. Thank you so much.